I'm Scott Horsburgh. Welcome to Yelling Up Steading. Today's DVD is all about the carcass construction of this sideboard. There are many ways in which we can put a carcass together, and this is just one way. When I was designing this piece, I wanted to have the interior of the sideboard a nice light colour. So I didn't want to use Jarrah on the inside. So that meant I really needed to veneer so that I could have Jarrah on the outside and a nice light wood on the inside of the carcass to help brighten it. All of the panels are veneered. These two horizontal panels and these two vertical panels are veneered and also have a Jarrah lip front and back, which are the rails that you can see. I like to glue up in small manageable stages so that I can be very confident that things are going as planned and everything is working out. I'm going to show you the eight different glue ups that I did to prepare this carcass and a few other things associated with bringing it home. I hope you get a lot out of this DVD. Let's get started. Before we get stuck into the nitty gritty of carcass construction and I go through the whole procedure of building the sideboard, we need to understand the properties of wood and how it moves so that we can build the carcass in the right way so that it doesn't pull itself apart. It stays together and everything moves in harmony. The sideboard is leg and rail and all of the panels are veneered. So wood movement has predominantly been removed from the equation. But still, we need to understand it. This cabinet here is solid wood. Timber very rarely changes its length, but it will move across its grain. As the humidity rises and falls with the various seasons in the year, it will expand and contract. When the humidity is high and there's moisture in the air, the timber will expand. And likewise, in Australia, in the summer months, when the humidity is low and the air is dry, the moisture is taken from the wood and it contracts. So with a, a carcass like this for this cabinet, the grain is running lengthways. So that in the cooler months when the humidity is high, this whole carcass can expand in harmony. And in the warmer months when the humidity is less, it can contract, all in harmony, together. If I had the sides running lengthways and the top piece with the grain running this way, we would have a problem. They would work against each other because these ones, the side panels, would move in and out and this one would move in and out. It would pull itself apart. By having the grain running uniformly right the way around, this carcass will only change its depth. The square opening at the front will not alter. So the doors will always work, they will never bind, and the drawer will also always work. Because this dimension inside is not changing, it's only changing its depth. You can see that the front doors are frame and panel. This panel is solid wood. So once again, it's not going to change its length, but it will change its width as the seasons come and go. So you can see that it has a nice rebate around it and it's there for a reason. It's there to enable this panel, which is basically floating inside this frame, to expand and contract across its width. It's only glued centre bottom and centre top. So it can 
move like this. If it was veneered, I could glue it all the way around and I, I wouldn't worry. So when we are gluing frame and panel doors like this and the panel is solid, we have to be very careful when we are actually gluing this together because we only want to fix it centre, top and bottom to enable it to move. But we also have to glue these bridle joints. If I get some squeeze out from the bridle joints and it just happens to stick to this corner where the panel is, it's going to fix that panel and it's not going to enable it to move. Then we're in danger of this panel splitting. The way to avoid that is to just wax the corners so that the glue won't adhere to the panel. And if there is a little bit of squeeze out, which really there will be, it's not going to adhere and it's not going to cause a problem. So whenever we're making a piece of furniture, we always need to bear in mind the way wood moves. Whenever I read woodworking magazines and I'm looking at the construction of a piece of furniture, I'm always interested in looking at the way the maker has put it together. If it's a cabinet, how they've put that carcass together, because there's lots of different ways. This is solid and the sideboard is leg and rail. Now we're going to have a really good look at the sideboard and I'm going to take you through the entire process of how I put it together. When I am making a piece of furniture, I am always conscious to try and make the glue ups as small and as manageable as possible. There's a lot of work that goes into preparing the pieces, the components, getting them to fit, cutting them right, planing them up, doing all of that work. And with a glue up, you get one shot. So rather than tackle big glue ups that are going to cause me undue stress, I try and build it in stages so that I'm concentrating on small glue ups at a time and gradually putting it together. Here is the carcass completely glued up and ready to be flushed. This carcass was glued up in eight separate stages. Glue ups one and two were the two end frames. This is one of the end frames. It's a very basic frame and panel construction. Everything is mortise and tenoned, except for this top front and back rail, which I'm using dominoes for. The panel has a tongue and the frame has a groove. So it's a standard frame and panel with tongue and grooved joinery. I put the frame together dry so that I could accurately measure the dimensions of the panel. Then I cut the panel, making sure that I was including the tongue that was to go into the housing right the way around. You can see that I've, rather than have the panel flush with the frame, I have left a one mil gap right the way around. That's just to create a nice shadow line and sort of give it the appearance of being solid. Uh, it's veneered so I'm not concerned about the movement of this panel because it won't expand and contract with changing humidity. It will stay exactly as it is. If it were solid, I would be concerned and you would definitely see a gap and it would be, it would be wider than one mil on each side. By me just leaving that slight gap, it's a feature that I like and it does give it the appearance of being solid. This was a very basic glue up. Before I did glue this up, I have finished this panel so that I could run beautifully off the ends with the cloth. Once it's glued in, it's difficult to, to finish down and, and up into here because you can't run off. So I finished the panel inside and out and I've also finished these inside edges that I wouldn't be able to get to once it's glued up. When I glued it up, it was a very basic glue up with 
four clamps, two on the top and two on the underside. I've just used paper shims like these to wedge in like that, making sure that they're exactly the same, the shims, and it helps to place the panel accurately and uniformly within the frame. When I actually cut the tongue on the panel, I then put the whole frame and panel together dry, and if there were slight differences in the gaps, I used my shoulder plane to just take them down so that they were all the same. You can see that the tenons, the long tenons at the bottom, come right through. I'm going to cut these flush prior to glue up and they will be wedged. When I have glued this, this frame and panel together, I haven't been concerned about the movement of the panel, so I haven't waxed the corners of the panel. I have spot glued everywhere along, all the way around, so that the panel is firmly fixed to the frame. And all I've been concerned about is wherever I was placing the shims, I didn't want glue because I wanted to just be able to pull these straight out once it had set. You can also see that the panel is not flush with the outsides of the frame. It's inset by 2mm. That's to create a nice shadow line and it's also just another detail that I like. One of the other reasons why I have this panel slightly inset from the outside faces of the frame is that when I flushed the joinery, it was much easier for me to flush it with my hand plane having this panel inset because I could come across and turn the corner and even bring the plane right over the corner like that without worrying about interfering with this finished panel. As with all of the joinery in the sideboard and in every piece you make, you flush it with the hand plane and you get it perfectly flat and you maintain all of the crispness in your edges. So by having the panel inset, it's very easy. You're not even concerned about about touching it because you don't go anywhere near it. The third glue up was this central mini carcass which comprised these two uprights and these two horizontal pieces. That was glue up three. So the two end frames and this central section here are the pieces that are currently glued together. Before I glued the central piece together here, I finished all of the insides of these panels. By finishing these panels before they were glued up, I was able to just run the cloth straight off the end when polishing. If I would glued this together and then finished them, it's very difficult to finish adequately when you're coming into corners like this. So by finishing the piece prior to glue up where I needed to, it made it very easy for me to finish well. It also meant that when I was gluing this up, I really didn't want to get squeeze out because I didn't want to mess with the finished surface. So 
I applied the glue accurately with the brush and made sure that I didn't have any squeeze out. The fourth glue up was gluing the top rail and this central draw divider to this central carcass. And the fifth glue up was doing the same on the back. The top back rail and the top central draw divider to this central carcass. The sixth glue up was bringing this central bit together and gluing it to the bottom rails. When that was done, the base needed to be put in place because it sits on a rebated edge. There you can see the rebate along the bottom rails to house the base. This is the base here. I dry clamped the carcass together so that I could determine ex the exact measurement of the base. I marked, I measured it very carefully. This is the base which has been veneered on both sides. The holes that you see drilled here are so that I can screw from the underside of the base into the vertical panels. I am not Gluing them to the base, I am screwing from the underside. On the underside of this base, you will see that I've countersunk those screws, screw holes, just to make it neat. So here you can see the base in place. And there's a couple of things that I'm looking for and I'm concerned about initially. First of all, I want to make sure that when the base is in, it's not holding the end frames off the rails. I want to make sure that when I'm clamping, these can pull up nice and tightly. Secondly, I want to make sure that the base will not hold the central carcass off the front and back rails. So I can check that just by putting some weight on it to make sure it's down and putting a straight edge through and having a look at where I can see light. And it looks as if it's just a fraction of a mil under, which is exactly how I want it. As I mentioned before, I've got three holes drilled through here. This is where that central carcass will sit and I'm going to screw from underneath. Glue ups number seven and eight were the final two to bring the carcass home to completion. Glue up number seven was bringing this end frame and this large draw support in to the long rails and this central carcass. So to do that, I kept this end frame behind me attached to the long rails and the, the top rails. And then I supported underneath these two lower rails so that I could then knock this end frame off. And it would still be supported at exactly the same height as it is now. I then glued up the tenons and the mortises and I brought the end frame in with this coming in as well to this side 
piece of this central carcass. Once I had it all clamped in, the last job was wedging the tenons. Glue up number eight was exactly the same. So I supported underneath these two lower long rails so that I could knock this end frame off. I placed glue on all of the mortises and all of the tenons and then I brought the end frame back in together with this large drawer support and finally once it was clamped I wedged the tenons. And then the carcass was complete. Once your carcass is glued up, it is then ready to be flushed. It doesn't matter how accurately you mark out your joinery, when you glue it together, chances are you might just have minute little steps where two pieces of wood meet. Flushing is truing all of those little steps up and making the whole thing flush and flat. The quick way would be to use an orbital sander like this, but unfortunately the results won't be very accurate. If you are trying to flush narrow pieces like these and you are using an orbital sander, you will lose all of the flatness and the straightness and the squareness that you've strived so hard to achieve by hand planing up all of these pieces. It's very difficult to use one of these accurately on such small pieces of wood. There's a real danger that you'll roll it and you'll start to curl edges over. Also, if one step is a little bit large, there is also a tendency to just concentrate on it and dig this in and rub. And then you've definitely lost all your flatness and straightness. The way to flush a carcass is by using your hand plane with a razor sharp blade and a fine shaving. I'm going to show you how to do that now. After I glued up the ends, the two end frames, I flushed them. So the only flushing I need to do on the end frames now is where the through tenons come out with the wedges. So I'm going to flush the sides only where the through tenons come out. I need to flush the front, the back and the top. I'm going to start with the top. In flushing the top, we're really concerned about getting everything flat and square and true so that when the top of this sideboard sits on, on it, it's not fitting nice and tightly to all of the outside edges. The way we do that is by using our straight edge and our squares to always check where we need to take off wood. And we're really just looking for it to be either perfectly flat or to have a very slight incline inwards, which I mean a very slight incline is just a ray of light under your square so that everything can sit very tightly to the outside edges. When I say a ray of light, this is what I mean. This is an end frame. So these are the legs and this is that panel, the veneered panel and there's also a rail through here. That would be perfect to have it dead flat like that. But to make sure that the top will sit very tightly against all of the outside edges, when I say angled inwards, that is a, an exaggeration just to show you what I mean. So if you put your square on from the outside face, you would see a ray of light under there. So it's very slightly angling in. 
So before I commence flushing the carcass, I have used my straight edge and my square to accurately check around the top so I know exactly where I need to take wood. I've also marked the direction of the grain of each piece. So for example, I'm going to concentrate on the back section so I don't get in the way of the camera. This back rail runs this way, the grain runs this way, and this side rail runs front ways. So I can see that I need to take a little bit off the top of the leg, which is end grain, and a little bit off the inside edge of that top rail, as well as this row. It's a little bit high there. So I'm going to start on the inside. Use my hand as a fence, my fingers as a fence here, while just having my thumb on the hand plane there. And I'll walk it through. And when I get to the corner here, I can just turn. So I can keep going. And come up there. Always check now I can also see that the rail is flush with the leg here or pretty much needs to come off a little bit but it's about four tenths of a millimeter high up this end so I do need to take a bit off here The whole thing with flushing, whether it be the front, the top, the back, the sides, whatever, is because you've marked the grain direction on all of the pieces, when you come to that join, you can move your plane from one to the other. And it doesn't matter if you're taking a little bit of a cross cut. If the blade is razor sharp, you will be fine. Turn the corner. It's not taking much off there yet because it's still a bit high here. So the back end of the plane is holding it off this rail. That's the beauty when you've got a perfectly flat plane. It really does make achieving what you need to achieve a lot easier. Always check as you're going along. Pop your straight edge across and you're looking for it to be touching at the front and the back edges. And if there's a ray of light under here, that's fine. There you go. Flushing the carcass back is exactly the same procedure as flushing the carcass top. I have marked the grain direction on all of the pieces that I need to flush that is the joinery that I need to flush and now I'm just going to very carefully show you a couple of the joints that I will flush and it's a matter of just maneuvering the plane so that you are crossing the join and you will end up with having your carcass flushed and it will be flat and true and your lines are very crisp so, let's start with some of these central ones here. So the grain on this bottom rail is running this way, then this piece runs up this way, and this piece along this way. 
So that one's a bit low there, so I will need to take a little bit more off the bottom rail. But just to try and show you that if I came across like this, that is all it is. It's a very fine, small shaving. And I've just about flushed that already. Plane. It's quite awkward getting in and out. And don't rush, just persevere. It's quite rewarding. This is the whole basis of your piece of furniture and when you've got it flushed and it's nice and flat and true, it, it looks fantastic. You can frequently pop your straight edge across just to make sure that you're not introducing any angles like that. If your joinery is reasonably accurate you should only be having to take off you know a fraction of a mil one or two tenths of a millimeter After you have flushed the joinery on the carcass, if you have a close look, you will be able to see the plane marks where you've curled into something. Because you're not going exactly straight with the grain, you've curled from one piece which is right angled to another one into the other one and you'll see that you've left a slight curl mark with the plane. All I do then is because you've, you've flushed it and you've got it flat and you've taken a very fine shaving, I just pop a bit of 320 wet and dry sandpaper on a block because I don't want to introduce any, any bumps and I then just sand up to the joint, don't cross it, just to take out those slight little plane marks and then the other way along that way as well. So that would be up this way on this one. And that way you just remove all of those telltale plane mark signs and you've got a perfectly flushed, perfectly flat back of the carcass. The procedure for the front is exactly the same. So once I'm happy with the back, I'll just put this back up on its legs, flip it over onto its back, and then I'll flush the front. The housing for the back of the sideboard. Because this sideboard is quite large, and there's quite a few different components that need to be flushed in the carcass for the front and the back, I decided to glue it all together and then flush it once it was glued together, purely because there were so many different pieces. If it were a smaller carcass, I would have put it together dry and then flushed the back when it was put together dry. That way I can take it apart and I know that the back is flushed and then when all of the individual pieces are loose, 
I can prepare the housing for the back. It's much easier to do when they're loose and individual. You can use the router table, you can use your freehand router, but at your bench, it, it's easier to control it. But because this was so large, I'm doing it now because I needed to have everything together and then flush it. There's a few different ways you can do the back of a, of a carcass. I will be making five separate backs for this carcass and I'm going to glue all of them in except for these top two here because it would be handy to be able to take them out to remove the top if it ever needed to be removed. But the rest of them I'm going to glue in. You can screw them in or glue them in, it doesn't matter. Or you can slide them in from the top into a groove. But these ones will be glued. They're going to be a frame and panel construction, all of them, and glued in. So now that I have flushed the back and it's flat and it's level and it's square, I'm just going to use my freehand router to route a groove around the five different areas where the five different backs will go to a depth of 12 mil, which isn't that deep. It, it, ideally, it would have been best to have gone a little bit deeper, maybe 16, but I'm going 12. So that, that will be the width of each back, and then it will be glued in. So I'm just going to use my handheld router freehand, and I have a rebating bit that cut a 6mm rebate. So I'm going to do that now while I've got it backside face up. And it's really simple. It has a bearing so I can only go as far as that bearing. And I'm just going to take it down gradually to a depth of 12mm and run it around. It will leave me with little circular curves at the corner which I will then just chisel out. So that's what I'm going to do now. The back of the carcass serves a very important function and I would think that the main function it serves is to help stiffen the carcass. The panels in these frame and panel backs are going to be veneered so they won't be moving. So I'm going to plane them to fit and glue them in and they will be a nice snug fit so they will greatly help to stiffen up this carcass. There you can see what it looks like with the backs in place. So the backs are very simple frame and panel construction. The panel is veneered as you can see, Jarrah on the outside and the white birch on the inside. So you can see how nice and bright it makes the interior of the carcass. So on the left and right hand side there will be two shelves and in the middle section there will be one shelf. So the backs really are the last thing that you would glue in place once you've fitted the doors and drawers and the top. By putting them in last it enables you to to have free access from the back which is handy when you're fitting door catches and drawer stops and just striving for that perfect fit. It enables you to see when things are connecting and, and when they aren't. You can also see how the back would greatly help to stiffen the carcass and add to its structural integrity. You can see that I have added a mitered frame to the top of the carcass. It's called a spacer frame and the top will then sit on 
top of this spacer frame and be fixed to this. It's a nice detail, I like it. It's set back 10mm from the outside of the main carcass and the top will not overhang very much at all. It, it's a really nice detail and it creates some nice shadow lines. You can see there's a square hole here. That is a housing for one of these traditional shrinkage buttons which are used to fix the top to the carcass. It's going to be a solid top so these buttons will allow the top to move and still be attached to the carcass. It will enable it to move across its grain. The, the grain is going to be running lengthways so it's going to expand and contract from front to back as the seasons come and go. So that will slot in there like that and it will move in and out as the seasons change. This mitered frame has just been screwed to the carcass. Here are the traditional shrinkage buttons at this end of the spacer frame. Well, the purpose of all of them is to enable the top piece to move across its grain. So these ones along the front and the back will simply just move in and out. Now I'm going to have a join right down the centre of the top. It'll be two pieces. So the button in the middle will be fixed and you'll notice that the square housing at the front end and the back end are wider and that is to enable it to expand and contract across its grain. So the ones at the front and the back will go in and although they're firm they can slide backwards and forwards to enable the top to move so that it won't crack. Thanks for watching this DVD on carcass construction. I hope that it has given you an insight into one of the ways that a carcass can be put together. For me, I think one of the keys of, of accurate carcass work is in the marking out of all of the various components. Wherever you have components that need to be a similar length or dimension, Put them together on your bench, clamp them if necessary, and mark them out as one. And that way when you scribe a knife line, either off a, a marking knife or a marking gauge, you're guaranteed that they are all exactly the same. Thank you for watching.